Hello, uh, we are on to chapter five of Sansuk. Um, I feel like in a way I should invest in like, I don't know, higher end equipment. I'm literally recording this on my phone and using my phone's microphone. <laughs> Look, you can see myself reflected in my glasses. Hello. <laughs> um, but also I kind of like the homemade feel of it. Uh, let me know what you guys think, uh, if you think I should be more professional. Um, but yeah. Um, I don't know yet because I'm recording this so far ahead of like where I am but I've asked my brother I mentioned this at the end of the fourth chapter to record me kind of Lord of the Rings-esque sounding music to be like an intro outro for these and also the intros if you'll notice are amazing artwork by Fish Fingers and Scarves who was the one who made these books um so yeah uh, go follow them on the socials. I will obviously link them in the description for their amazing artwork. Oh. And thank you for letting me, thank you to them for letting me use it. Uh, anyway, without further ado, I will stop rambling. Um, obviously, if you're listening to this on SoundCloud, you won't see the artwork. So go to the YouTube video to see that. Anyway, without further ado. Dwarves of Erebor! Dees stood at the gates of Ered Lewin, her eyes flashing and her hair streaming behind her in the cool spring breezes. The last caravan to Erebor watched her attentively, their faces bright and eager. We are going home! she cried in her ringing voice of diamond and mithril, and a mighty cheer rose up from every throat. Turning, Dees began to walk away from the worked out mines and the crumbling halls of Belagost that had sheltered them in their poverty and raised her face to the east. She did not look back. Wagons rumbled along in her wake as she began to march. Now there's a proper Dwaro Dam, breathed Fries. Oh, my brave daughter. Thrain took her hand, and with wet eyes together they watched their last surviving child lead their people away from their reduced and pitiful lives towards the rising sun and Erebor. Thorin looked back over the great train of dwarves, carts, ponies, goats, and even a flock of sheep that stretched out behind his sister. Old dwarves walked doggedly, doggedly beside wagons that were pulled by oxen and draught ponies, their gnarled old hands wrapped around axes that had not seen use in decades. Families crowded in amongst their furniture on top of the wagon beds, and the older children eyed the guards and warriors that flanked the caravan with inquisitive and awed expressions. Keep up, keep up, Groin bellowed to a heavy cart that was dawdling. The foothills of the Blue Mountains slowly slipped behind them, and before them rose the little rolling hills of Eminwil, Emin and beyond that lay the great sheltered valley of the Shire. Got a long way to go as yet, my lads! The dwarves began to sing as they marched, and soon Thorin was humming along. Uh, I'm going to try and sing, but it might be a little bit rough. Um, and her beard was as soft as the downy wing of the birds that fly home at the call of spring. Oh, why did I leave her? Why did I roam? For now and forever I'll be marching home. I've not heard that one before, Gimli remarked, trudging alongside his father. "'Tis an old traveller's song, son, Gloin said, and as he had every time since returning to his family, his face creased with be bemused pride. His reunion with Mijim Gimris and Gimli upon his arrival at Ered Lewin had been nothing short of spectacular. Gloin had wrapped himself round his wife and held on to her tightly, burying his face in her pale hair. She put her hands either side of his head and drew it back, tracing the old scar over his brow with her thumb before kissing him deeply and gently. Hello, you old bear, she said softly, her hand slipping into his mane of wild red hair. You're late. Jewel, he said, and his eyes misted over. More lovely than ever you are, Mijim, crown of my life, light of my heart. Don't think you can sweet-talk me into forgiving you now, she scolded him before kissing him again. His hard, craggy face softened as she rested her head against his chest for a moment. He took her hands and kissed them one after the other before turning to his children, and his mouth slowly formed the shape of an O. Thorin privately thought his expression was hilarious. Frerin, of course, didn't keep such things private. His brother keeled over backwards, laughing his head off. Gloin's amazement was justified. Nearly three years wrought quite a ch change in a growing dwarf, after all. Gimris now appeared more queenly than ever, all gold and topaz, the fiery sun to her mother's pale moon. And Gimli was no longer a lad. He was a strong and sturdy young Kuzd, 
his arms thick with muscle and his beard lengthening rapidly. Gloin had gawked for a long moment longer before Gimli was hurling herself at her dad, and Gimli was doing likewise. And Gloin was buried beneath the bodies of his two mostly grown dwarfs and groaning. Oof, you're too heavy for me now. Off with you, he wheezed. And Thorin chuckled at the sight of the bristly and imposing old warrior, spluttering and choking for breath. When he was pulled to his feet once more and had regained some dignity, he took a delighted reverent breath and touched the faces of his children with two great thick hands. Now look at these two giants, he said softly. Who is this brawny young warrior with the mighty beard? Who is this stout and strapping beauty with the hands of a craftswoman? Where are the wee badgers I left behind three years ago? We missed you, blurted Gimrys. Missed you so much, echoed Gimli, and Gloin tugged them close and held them tightly. Inudoi, Nathith, he said against their hair, his eyes squeezing shut. Gimli, my son, Gimli's my daughter, I missed you so much, my treasures. Nizim bit down on her lip and wrapped her arms around them all. Don't you go off, be going off on any more fool quests, she said in a low voice, and Gloin only tightened his embrace. Bomba's re reunion with his family had been far louder. Alaris didn't even have a chance to greet her husband before a veritable horde of dwarflings swarmed Bomba and Bofa, shouting at the top of their lungs. Bomba's ch children buried themselves against his warm and hefty body, snuggling close, investigated to walk his walking staff with curious and grubby fingers, pulled at Uncle Bofa's hat and begged for a song and a sweet and a story. Both Bomba tried to kiss and tickle all of them at once, his seldom heard booming laugh ringing out over the din. The oldest of the tribe patiently pulled the smaller ones away, and finally Al Reese was able to give her husband a smack and kiss and show him the new baby, now two years old, a boy she had named Albu. He was a chubby, chuckling little thing with brown hair and eyes that danced like sunlight on water. Bomba gave the little one a whiskery bust on the top of the head and then wrapped one arm around Al Reese again and pulled her against him for another ringing kiss. Hello, love, he said and rubbed his face against her. I missed you, my dumpling. What have you done to your leg? She said breathlessly. He shrugged. Got poisoned. Don't recommend it. Poison, Daddy? Gasped one of the middle children, his eyes wide as saucers. Don't get too close to orcs, Bofa said succinctly, and a chorus of oohs rose from the crowd of children. Hospital food, Bomba said in disgust, and Alrys threw her head back and laughed and laughed. It was because of his leg that Bomba had relinquished his pony and chosen to drive a wagon. Children festooned him and he could be heard telling them recipes and stories as he guided the shaggy, sure-footed draught ponies. His reviews of elvish cookery were particularly colourful. At nice, night, Dees would walk amongst the wagons and carts and check the perimeter and the watches herself. The many campfires made the Valley of the Loon appear like a bowl full of golden embers. Then she would return to her place at the head of the train and take her rest. Now and then, Gimli or Gimrys would join her, sometimes Mijim, but most often she was solitary a tall, straight sentinel watching over the scurrying of the dwarves below. With her hand on the pommel of her sword, she stood guard over them, her eyes sad and fond and determined. Thorin stood at her shoulder and looked over their people, returning to their home at long last. Thank you, sister, sister, he murmured. I love you, Nadadith. Look after them for me, would you? She tucked a braid behind her ear and sighed. Thorin took watching the journey with religious dedication. He still had to make his amends, after all, and although he had made a start, he was still not convinced that he had done enough. His family joined him on occasion, but like Dees, he was very often alone. His time became structured and orderly. His meals, his forge, his family, and the chamber of Sansukul. It was slow going. Travelling with so many wagons and children meant that the caravan moved at a far more leisurely pace than Thorin's company had set. Bofor especially seemed to chafe at the dawdling, as he called it, and often ranged ahead with his mattock on his shoulder. Occasionally he brought along one of Bom Bomba's elder children, and once or twice he brought Gimli, to that lad's great excitement. Nothing happened, although they did spy a party of elves making their way to Mithlond, the Grey Havens, where they would depart Middle-earth forevermore. That's an elf, Gimli said, wrinkling his nose, and here I thought they were supposed to be fair and glorious. Humph, <laughs> they're all stretched and faded. Bofa chuckled. Don't be fooled. They might look skinny and sipid twigs, but they're stronger than they appear and their eyesight is much better than ours in daylight. An elf will put an arrow through your eye as soon as look at you. No beards at all, Gimli muttered under his breath and shuddered. The caravans forded the river Loon with great care and began to follow the old north road, built in the ancient days of the kings of men, passing south of the Emin Mill. Eventually the grey and rocky lands gave way to little green rolling hills, grassy sheltered valleys and carefully tended farms, even further to the house, south, 
smoke, smoke rose from little chimneys. Thorin glanced around at the peaceful, plentiful land and felt something clench somewhere in his stomach. As dusk drew near, Dee signalled for them to make camp on a hill covered in nodding dandelions and clover. Bees hummed merrily from their nest in a lone apple tree covered in blossom, and birds piped in the distance from a nearby wood. Bomber shared a pointed look with Gloin. Gloin shrugged. He'll be here. He promised. Which way is Hobbiton from here? Bofa shaded his eyes with his hand. Bomber's eldest was wearing his hat. She was a jolly dryadam of sixty called Baris, with dimpled cheeks and a sunny smile, and she marched along behind her uncle with one of her siblings on her shoulders. Southeast, said Gloin after a moment. And there, look! A little figure was making its way along the widening paths between the little hills, running as fast as its large woolly feet would carry it. A pack full of filter bursting bounced on his on its back, and his hands were waving excitedly. Oh, Bilbo! Gloin shouted, waving back. Is that a hobbit? whispered Gimri's to her brother. Again, no beard, Gimli said and shook his head in sympathy. Bilbo came to the head of the caravan, puffing and holding one hand to the side of his chest. Oh, it's been a little while since I ran that quite that hard, and carrying so much, too, too, he said ruefully. Hello again. My goodness, I see what old Bolger was, Odo Bolger was so excited about. There are an awful lot of you, aren't there? With that, the hobbit was engulfed in a hug, and there was much back patting and smiles all around. Bomber tapped his forehead to Bilbo's, and Bo Bofa tousled his curly hair as Gloin beamed at him. Thorin felt his father come to stand behind him. So that was him. Thorin nodded silently. Thrain regarded the hobbit for a moment, and then he grunted and put a heavy hand on Thorin's shoulder. I'm sorry, my son. Thorin just kept gazing at the brave little soul that could have, should have, been his. Thrain's powerful fingers tightened on Thorin's shoulder. I'll leave you be, he said kindly. We're here if you need us, Thorin. Remember that. Thorin nodded again and swallowed around his dry throat. Thrain's fingers squeezed, squeezed once more, and then he was gone. You should hear the ruckus down at the Green Dragon, Bilbo was saying. Poor old Odo is convinced it's an invasion and has the whole pub in an uproar. Half of Brandy Hall, that's the Brandy Bugs, by the way, want to come out and see it for themselves. The other half want to sound the horn call of Buckland. The brace girls are wringing their hands and fainting. The grubs are calling it none of their business. And the boffins are trying to organise a welcoming party. And the toques are giggling up their sleeves and egging everyone on indiscriminately. Oh, sorry. Pausing there for a second. I've got a really itchy eye. <laughs> sorry. Carrying on. And the Bagginses, said Bomber, smiling. Bilbo laughed gaily, pretending they've never even heard of dwarves or dragons or adventures or rich mad cousins. Whenever someone brings it up, they begin talking loudly about the weather or pie-eating contests or farm farmer mad at dogs or some such. It's terrifically funny. We don't normally pass so close to the Shire, said Bofa, but seeing as it's the last load, so to speak, we thought we'd suggest a detour. So all of the Blue Mountains are emptied. Bilbo looked downcast. Oh, I hope you'll be coming back and forth for some time. Well, we've got our home back now, haven't we? Said Gloin and patted his little fellow on the back. Thorin wanted to chop his hand off. I suppose, Bilbo said, and his shoulders slumped. Here, Bilbo, Bomber said into the ensuing silence. You should meet my family. That's Baris, my eldest, and over there's Bomfer, Bolroar and Bofur, my terrible little trio of redheads. And the two big dark-haired lads there are Barum and Barur, then there's Alfur and Alrur and Alfries and Bomfries tormenting that poor pony. Barum, stop that lot, would you? Before the pony dies of nerves. And over there is my lovely wife Alrys and our two littlest ones, Bibur and Albur. Alrys sketched a bow, her arms filled with squirming child. At your service, she called cheerfully. Thorin was a little dizzy after all those names. Bilbo seemed to have no trouble with such a crowd and bowed to Alrys, smiling. And yours and your families. Though I may be a little pressed to accommodate so many. Good gracious me, Bomble, I'd think you were part hobbit. I like your feet, announced one of the horde of red dwarf red headed dwarflings. Why, thank you, Bilbo chuckled. They are indeed very respectable feet, even if the rest of, rest of me isn't. How long do you plan to stay camped here in the North Farthing? We'll be on the move almost immediately, said Gloin apologetically. Tomorrow morning, most likely. You know how it goes. My word, yes, Bilbo said and then sighed in disappointment. Well, let's make the most of tonight then, shall we? said Bofa. Bilbo perked up. Yes, yes, quite right. I brought a few little things for us to share, though. Now I hope they'll stretch far enough. You've seen how hobbits eat, said Gloin dryly. I'm fairly sure we'll do fine, laddie. And just think, Bilbo, no washing up. Bofa nudged him. Thorin wished everyone would stop hutching the hobbit. Bilbo ro rolled his eyes theatrically. Thank heavens. What did you bring? Bomber asked, rubbing his hang hands eagerly. Cheesecake? Here now, first you have to meet my set. 
said Gloin. This is my lad, Gimli, and my lass, Gimri's. Over there, tying down the cart, is my darling, Mijim. Mijim, come here. Come meet our burglar. I'm a little bu busy, you daft old bugger, she snapped, in case you haven't noticed. Gloin gave him a sheepish grin. She's the jewel of my life, she is. I'll go and help her, said Gimri's, touching her father's arm. Sorry, I'm just moving. Gloin nodded and patted her hand, and she went to help her mother secure the oilcloth and the ponies. Gimli and Bilbo regarded each other curiously. Hello there. Gimli, is it? Bilbo said. Bilbo Baggins, at your service. Gimli, son of Gloin, at yours. Gimli said automatically, and then tipped his head, studying the hobbit with an expression of slightly disturbed fascination. Doesn't your face get cold? Bilbo burst into giggles. Gloin tugged at his own beard to hide a smile. Ah, Gimli, my boy. Hobbits don't grow beards. Oh, some do. But only those of store families, Bilbo said, still giggling. Even then, it's nothing for a dwarf to boast of. I remember catching you all staring at me for the first couple of weeks when you thought I wasn't watching. And for the record, not one of you is good at being sneaky. Well, except Nori, but the rest of you were not exactly subtle about it. Was it my poor naked chin, then? That and your riding, laddie, Gloin said, and then snorted at the hobbit's expression of half, half amusement, half exasperation. Were we that rude? said Bofa, grinning. He barged into my house, pillaged my pantry, drafted me into an adventure and sang an extremely insulting song, Bilbo said, poking Bofa in the side. Staring was the politest thing any of you did. Ah, my apologies, mumbled Gimli, scratching at his head. No harm done, Bilbo reassured him. And to answer your question, yes, my face does get quite cold indeed, which is extremely inconvenient, but it dries wonderfully quick compared to yours. Bomber clambered down from the, his wagon with slow and careful movements. Gimli and Bofa came to help him, and he eased his weight onto his leg before grabbing his walking staff and limping forward. So, what did you bring us then, Master Baggins? Bilbo's eyes lit up, and he dragged his bulging pack from his back. I've got cheese, apples, bread, beer, three pies, a leg of lamb cooked in long cleef style, a cured ham, a great plum duff, and a whole brace of pheasant presents in here for you to take the others. I'm sure, I'm afraid it's rather a lot to carry. Bofa and Gloin shrugged, and Thorin tried not to smile. He really did, but what Bilbo considered a lot to carry was barely noticeable to Dwarrows. He never really understood how hardy and strong a dwarf could be, even after so much evidence. The hobbit dug through his overstuffed pack and made a soft aha sound. Here, he pushed a bundle of papers into Bomba's hands. All my mother's recipes. She was a took, you know, and collected recipes from all over the Shire, all the way as far east as Midgewater. Bomba looked down with wide eyes at the crushed bundle, and then pressed it protectively against his chest. Bilbo, he said, and his mouth open and closed like a fish. Oh, hush, it's the very least I could do, Bilbo said, ducking his flushed face. Now I have here. He handed both a, a strange configuration of sheepskin and dyed leather, with neat little stitch, stitches in the shire fashion around the edges. It's your hat, do you see? Bilbo said, anxiously wringing his hands. I bought the skins from the Proud Fleet, and I had it copied by Bel Gamgee. Yours was such a wreck, after all, and I thought you might like to have a new one. I do hope I haven't upset you. Bofa slowly opened up the folded brim of the new hat, dyed a handsome red-brown, and suddenly smiled. He pulled it onto his head, lifting his chin and tugging at the flaps. What do you think, lads? Oh, thank Mahal, I was going to burn the old one in his sleep, said Bomber with relief. Aye, very proper, Gloin said and nudged Bilbo. Thorin growled under his breath. Would nobody stop touching the hobbit? Looks like a mine full of diamonds, don't he? All right, don't lay it on too thick, said Bofa agreeably. Thank you kindly, Bilbo. It's a right fine hat. Why, I wouldn't be surprised if a hat made by a hobbit turns out to be lucky. Gloin, this is for you. Bilbo handed him a polished wooden box, its lids and sides carved with leaves and grapes. Gloin admired the carving for a moment and Bilbo huffed. Well, wood propping, working is probably the only hobbit craft that you fellows might, might appreciate. Still, it's not empty. Open it. Gloin cracked it open and Gimli peered over his father's shoulder to look inside. Pipeweed. Not just any pipeweed, my dear dwarf. That is Longbottom Leaf. It's the year of 32. A very good year indeed. My dear hobbit, Gloin said and eyed the box with new appreciation. I am deeply in your debt. Oh, think nothing of it, Bilbo said, beaming. Now, if you wouldn't mind, here, Gimli, would you give me a hand? Out of Bilbo's pack came the wrapped ham and lamb, the pies, the pudding and the cheeses, apples and a tightly stoppered jug. Now, Bilbo said, straightening his coat. The inks are for Ori and the bottles are delicate, so be careful. These herbs are for Oin, so are these notes. I translated a couple of tealing, healing texts from the Elvish. And there was a lot of work, so don't you dare throw them away. Ah, this is for Dory. 
It's an embroidery pattern book from my aunt Hildegard, and some of those patterns are old enough to impress even Dory, I dare say. I hope he can get some use out of it. Both opened the little book and smiled down at the curling designs with little their friendly motifs of flowers, leaves and vegetables. Who knows, perhaps hobbit stitching will become the new exotic fashion. You could start a trend. I fervently hope my trend-setting days are done, thank you very much, said Bilbo dryly. Now, this is for Nori, from one burglar to another. Bomber's forehead creased as he took in the candlesticks, the cheese knife and the little silver gravy boat. What's this? Bilbo rubbed a hand through his hair and smiled a trifle wickedly. I discovered after I got back that it wasn't only my frightful relatives who were a little too free with my belongings. A certain light-fingered chap had made off with as few small things on the night of the party. I thought he might like the rest of the set, with my compliments. Gloin burst into, out into roars of laughter, and even Gimli snickered. Bofa clapped a hand over his eyes and wasn't able to speak for a moment as his face began to turn red. Oh, he'll hate that! Bomber gasped. He's been found out, and he didn't even manage to pinch the lot. Oh, he'll be prickly for a month! Bilbo looked smug. That was rather the idea. Bofa pulled his new hat down over his eyes and waved frantically at him, them to go on as he panted, trying to get his laughter under control. I had this made for Barlin, Bilbo said, bringing out a curious little pot. Look at the sides. Gloin, Bomber, Gimli and Thorin, Bofa was still trying vainly to stop get laughing, peered closer to the little thing and then Gloin exclaimed, Why, that's the contract. Certainly, Bilbo said, turning the thing so they could see it. Deramac Brandybuck is quite a clever potter, don't you think? I wrote out what I could remember of my contract and told him to paint it on the sides. Poor Darren, his usual work is flowers and ducks and the occasional pumpkin vine. I don't think he was expecting all that about laceration, evisceration or incineration any more than I had. Did he faint? asked Bomber, leaning forward e eagerly. A wheezing little sound of glee came from under Bofa's hat. Bilbo paused and then he sighed. <sighs> yes. Thorin choked on his own laughter as the members of his company erupted once more. Gloin and Gimli ended up with their arms slung around each other's necks, while Bofa collapsed to the ground with his heels swinging into the air. Bomber wiped his eyes while Bilbo clutched to his sides and gasped. As their laughter began to side, side, subside, <clears throat> Bilbo choked out, Nope! And that set them all off again. Bomber began to lean heavily on his staff, and Bofa pounded the ground once or twice with a fist. Gloin was making tea kettle noises, and Gimli had to take on more of his father's weight. The poor lad was beginning to look rather red in the face. All right, all right, Bilbo managed to say between his chuckles. Well, on with it. I wasn't sure to get Biff, what to get Biffa until I remembered that he was a toy maker before he was a miner. And so he brought out a curious little thing with cogs and wheels. The assembled dwarves peered close with ex exclamations of interest. Yes, isn't it clever? It's a model of the old mill down at Hobbiton, you know. You can pour water in here and the wheel turns and it grinds away. Well, now, Bomber said as he gently took the model in his thick, thin fingered hands. Bofa peeked out from it under his hat. His face was bright red. Bofa, look, isn't that a dear little thing? My little lads would like that, they would. Being a hobbit and all, it seemed pretty special and out of the ordinary, Bofa said, smoothing down his ruffled moustache. Wonder if we could make a model bag end? Oh no! Oh no, 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 no! If I have an entire generation of dwarves trooping through my house, I will hunt you down and sting the pair of you, Bilbo said sternly. Bomber closed his mouth with a snap, but Bofa looked entirely too in innocent to be believed. Last one, Bilbo said, tutting and turning back to his nearly empty pack. Dwalin, murmured Thorin. Dwalin, said Bomber in the exact same tone, nodding. Glad to see one of you pays attention, Bilbo sniffed. Ah, here we are. What on earth, laddie? Gloin squinted at the myriad of brightly painted horse chestnuts string, string threaded through their middles. Traditional hobbit weaponry, Bilbo said a gleam in his eye. I in particular have some skill at it. If you must know. No, said Bofa in disbelief. Not, said Gloin. Conkers? Thorin said, utterly incredulous. Conkers? Gimli echoed, and then he blinked in confusion. Thorin cursed his lapse of attention. What? Has one of you been telling tales? Bilbo put his hands on his hips and grinned at them. I challenge you to a game, but it's really not a fair fight. Oh, really? Gloin said, his chest puffing out. Mighty sure of yourself there, Mr Baggins? Well, We'll soon see about that. Before long, Bilbo had all four, plus Gimri, Sparis and Midian, squabbling over a game of conkers. The jug was open to reveal a strong spirit that was met with general approval. Perhaps not for the one, young ones. That's Gaffer Gamgee's home distilled apricot brandy, you know. And the cheese and ham were quickly unwrapped and passed around. 
The Dwyers threw themselves into the game with their usual healthy competitiveness, but Bilbo hadn't exaggerated his skill. He was winning easily and grinned triumphantly every time his horse chestnut knocked another out of the game. Thorin watched with a sen certain sense of bemusement. And they do this for sport, he muttered to himself. Peculiar folk. Here now, that's mine. You cheated. No, I'm the green one. You're the blue one. Any an idiot can see this one is teal. Honestly, call yourself my brother. Jim Reese, lay off. Ha! That's three to me. Too bad. I'm on seven. Gloin, can't you? Best not to get involved, laddie. Bilbo leaned back, sighing with satisfaction, and slapped his knees. And that's the game to me. Are all hobbits so good at throwing and aiming things? Bofa said, staring dismally at his halved horse chestnut. He hadn't won a single round. Bilbo shrugged. Bit of a hobby, really. The commotion had brought some attention to the group. Many of the other dwarfs went, sent curious glances over to the hobbit and his odd little game, his bare face and furry feet. Thorin bristled at their interest and barely restrained himself from barking at them to show their burglar the proper respect. The gawking stopped abruptly when a tall dwarodam in a fur-lined hood came through the crowd to check on all the fuss. Dwarves and hobbit all fell silent, and Dees raised a dark eyebrow at the game on the ground. Gimli? She said, turning to him. Ah, hello, Aunt Dees, he said, scrambling to his feet and brushing off his trousers. Just passing the time. The corner of her mouth twitched, and she turned to where Bilbo sat on the grass, fidgeting with a chestnut. Will you not introduce me? Ah, I, of course, Gimli said and cleared his throat. Dees, daughter of Fries, I make known to you Bilbo Baggins of the Shire. He's a hobbit, he added unnecessarily. I can see that, Akunith, she said, her mithril pure voice lilting with amusement, though her face barely moved. Dees, at your service. Bilbo pulled himself upright and tried to look as dignified as a hobbit can whilst holding a horse chestnut painted bright yellow. At yours and your family's. Dees smiled at that, rather sadly. You already have been. There was an awful silence and then Bilbo burst out. You look so much like him. She froze and then she dropped her eyes. Bilbo's mouth worked soundlessly and then he looked down. I'm sorry, he mumbled wretchedly. I shouldn't have said that. I'm always sticking my foot in my great silly mouth. Thorin couldn't sell stop himself from taking a short, sharp intake of breath, his hand reaching out to touch Bilbo's shoulder. His fingers passed through it and he bit down hard on his lip until the sour taste of iron filled, flooded his mouth. Dees lifted her head again as she took a breath. Yes, we were very alike, she said eventually although my brother was taller and he had our mother's eyes. Oh, of course, I... Bilbo wrung his hands together. I just... Calm yourself, Master Hobbit, she said, and then she bowed to him with all the poise of her rank and all the dignity of a queen. Thank you for all you did for us. For them. Bilbo sniffed loudly and his face was screwed up against tears, his clever little hands balled at his sides. Thorin knelt before him and ghosted his hand over the back of Bilbin's ar Bilbo's arm. Thank you, Bilbo, he echoed. I didn't, Bilbo managed, and then he buried his face in his palm. Oh dear, he quavered. Oh dear, oh dear. Gimli, Thorin said desperately, help him. The young dwarf shifted his weight between his feet for a moment, looking uncertain. Then he said, Mr Baggins was showing us a hobbit game, Aunt Dees. All heads turned to him and he flushed as red as his hair before ploughing on bravely. It's a mite tricky to get the hang of, but I was starting to see how it was done. Do you want to try it? Bilbo blinked and Dees looked rather perplexed. If Mr. Baggins is amenable, she said, turning back to the bemused hobbit. Certainly, he said, giving Gimli a long, bewildered stare. Call to Conkers. Aye, it's dreadfully fiddly, said Bofa, finally finding his voice. I'm the best at it, said Gimli proudly. proudly. Except for Bilbo here, Gimli said immediately, and he crossed his arms over his broad chest, scowling. And you gloat. Gloating's all part of the fun. Gimri said with a toss of her bright head. Not my fault you couldn't win a game against a dead orc. Gimri's! His imp snapped. Here, said Gloin, and handed Dees the red horse chestnut, his hands gentle as he gave up his place. Sit down, cousin. I'm going to see if I can find Bomber a chair. Oh, don't bother on my account, Bomber protested, but tucked by his side, young Baris nodded vigorously. Bomber grunted and poked his daughter in the shoulder, and she wrinkled her nose. Your, leg, your leg's going to get all cramped sitting like that, Dad. Best to stretch it out. Aunt Dees, Gimli said softly, and she hesitated for a moment before sitting down beside her young cousin and patting his knee. Don't fret about me, young one, she said. Time for your sister to watch her back. All right then, if that's everyone, Bilbo said and picked up his yellow horse chestnut. Much, much later, the rumblings of hundreds of sleeping dwarfs drifted through the pleasant shire air towards the star-studded night. 
Bilbo was rolled snugly into a blanket and curled up between Bofa and Bomba's bedrolls for old time's sake. Thorin sat opposite them as Bomba's snores shook the ground and felt something in him begun to un begin to uncurl and loosen. He leaned back and looked up at the sickle moon and almost, almost felt alive. It could have been any night of the quest, really. It could have been just another night on the road, guarding over his rumbling, sleeping company. Just himself and the snores of his people and the calls of night birds under the watchful night sky. Just like old times, Bilbo said with a yawn. My word, those stars are bright. Oh, I have missed all this. Bofa rolled over and poked his head out from under his blanket. Well, he said slowly. Hmm? Bilbo sounded half asleep already. You could come with us. Thorin's head whipped back to them faster than an elven arrow. Bilbo seemed equally shocked. What? Come with us. I know the others would be thrilled to have you back, and I know you miss us. Bilbo blinked, and then he finally let out a sigh of melancholy. I can't, he said, and there was true regret in his voice. Bofa, I'd love to stay with all of you, but I just can't. Erebor, it, it's too big. It's too empty for me. Filling up pretty fast from all accounts, I hear, Bofa said. Bilbo's smile was anything but happy. He swallowed hard and said, bravely, if hoarsely, it's not that sort of empty. We'll even make you a little room and cram it full of doilies. It's empty because he's not in it. Bilbo interrupted shortly, and then he rolled over and tucked himself inside his blanket. The anger rushed back in a flood. The illusion of watching over his company on their quest was just that, a lie, a figment of his delusional mind. Thorin was dead, not alive. Thorin had been dead for three years, and still, his guilt and grief and rage tore at him. He stared uselessly at the patchwork of Bilbo's blanket and the familiar twisting sensation knotted in his belly. I will look after you, he said. I will make my amends. Bofa was still and he patted Bilbo's back. I'm so sorry, he said softly. Yes, well, Bilbo sighed, straightening slightly and resting his head against his hand. I should really change in that trade in that lucky number title of mine, shouldn't I? I had all the luck in the world, but it wasn't enough. Never is. Both said in a voice that was nearly a whisper. You won't need luck, I swear it. Thorin foul, vowed fiercely. Mahal be my witness. You won't need luck. You've got me. Well, uh, that's the end of chapter five. Uh, I read that all in one sitting. Uh, I think that's quick. I don't know why like one chapter was like 50 minutes long. They're all going to be a bit shorter than that. Um, but yeah, that was chapter five. So next chapter will be chapter six. And, um, well, you'll know before I do whether this has the music or not. Uh, if it does, I hope you are liking that. I will see you next time for chapter six. All right, bye.